Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, the Bing Course Lecture is just finishing up, so I expect we're going to have a, a number of people coming in just a, a few minutes later after the Bing Course Lecture is done. I'm Warren Hill from Mesa, Arizona, and um, I have an interest in IOL power calculations, as I'm sure all of you do. And today we really have a kind of an all-star uh, faculty, um, uh, Francis Price, uh, Mike Snyder, Adi Abulafia, all the way here from Israel, and Helga Sandoval is, is uh, taking uh, Carrie Solomon's place today and is going to share with us some, some truly um, amazing numbers that are, uh, the only thing that's even more amazing is it's not amazing for this practice. So um, Francis Price is going to be our first speaker, and Dr. Price is the head of the Price Vision Group and Cornea Research Foundation in Indianapolis. He's authored, authored over 200 peer-reviewed uh, ophthalmic publications and book chapters and has been the principal investigator in 100 uh, clinical studies of ophthalmic devices, uh, medications, and techniques. Dr. Price will speak to us about how the LensStar has optimized his workflow. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and it was great to get the exercise uh, coming down the hall. See. So, uh, as Warren said, I'm going to talk about how it's helped our practice out and optimized our cataract workflow. I can get this. There we go. Uh, only relevant financial disclosure is Hogstripe. So, Warren will probably talk about uh, the RBF formula, which is great for normal eyes, but when we've looked at our practice, only 43% of our IOL implants are for normal eyes. Uh, we take care of a lot of uh, unusual problems. 12% uh, of our cataracts are previous refractive surgery. 25% are combined with primarily DMEC. 3% keratoconus. 6% have had a previous PK or DALC. And 11% are a variety of other problems. Now, we have a high concentration of ocular surface disease. And so with all of our testing, the place we start out is to make sure the ocular surface is in good condition. And you can call this dry eyes, you can call it ocular surface disease, but whatever the issue is with the ocular surface, if that's not in good shape, you're not going to get good information. We've all heard garbage in, garbage out. And so you can get wide fluctuations in your measured Ks, the amount of astigmatism, the axis of the astigmatism, if you don't have a good ocular surface. So that's where we start first because we want to make sure our measurements are accurate. So we actually start out with topography in our practice first. And I've shown here, this is not one of the worst ones by any means, but it shows a picture on the left of an eye that came in and was a little bit dry. And there's the SAI on this one, the uh, looks at the regularity of the surface of the cornea. And what's nice is that in the picture on the left, it comes out red. And I've been able to train my text that if it's a red picture, you know, we can't use these pictures unless there's something wrong, like an irregular graph that accounts for it. So we treated this patient for a month with uh, dry eye treatments. And uh, the picture on the right is how it looked after treating their dry eyes. And you can see that the amount of cylinder decreased substantially, as did the axis. So it would change the way that we would plan the surgery if we're trying to come out with a refractive uh, refraction of Plano after surgery. So we have to get the ocular surface in good condition before we do any other testing. So we have two tracks. We have the easy track of people who don't have ocular surface disease. Our testing is good. We do the lens star and everything's uh, usually pretty easily. We have the more difficult tracks. And when we have the more difficult tracks with complicated eyes, it's nice to have a system that allows input into what's a good measurement where you just don't take the picture and you have no idea of how good it is. And it's often helpful to be able to change the reference points as, as well and essential to eliminate poor measurements. And it's nice to be able, when you're looking at IOL formulas, to compare different formulas for a lot of these abnormal eyes. So in particular, how did the lens star help us? Well, the first thing we were able to do is download its uh, readings into a PDF that could go into our EMR, and that got rid of a little data entry error and helped those doing the calculations not have to be next to the machine to do all of that. We were able to get more rapid measurements uh, in uncomplicated patients, and we were able to get lens thickness for the first time, which helps the accuracy of our calculations. Now, I look at this as like when we move from 
film to take our slit lamp and fundus photos to when we went to digital. And so the big advantage of digital is that you know right away if you got a bad photograph. And if it's bad, you delete it and redo it, just like we do on our phones. It used to be that if we had a bad photo, we wouldn't know till we got the film back a week later. And by then, it might be too late or the condition had changed. So this is the same thing with our IOL calculations. You don't want to be at the point when you're doing your calculations to realize that some of the measurements don't make sense, and then you have to remeasure the patient. So our techs can now tell if the measurements are good, and they get this right while they're doing the testing. If it's not right, they retake the measurements or delete the bad ones. And so the techs can also reset the endpoints if needed on some of the tests, like white to white and axial measurements. And so this empowers our techs, and that, of course, leads to happier techs and an easier flow in the office. So what we have here, and uh, I don't know, I guess I don't have a mouse to show any of this. Uh, these are the axial length measurements. And on the left, we have the measurements. And I want to start out by saying usually the lens star is right on. So we don't have very many of these where it's off. But the measurements of where the beginning and the end of the lens was, was off just a little bit. So the tech could go back and reset that to make it a little bit more accurate, as you see on the right. Here are the K measurements, and what we usually have is a series of uh, five different readings that are each comprise four, four times that it's done the measurement, and it averages all of that. And so on the left side, you can see that there's a blink in one of these, so you may want to delete that one. That's the reason that we got rid of the, uh, the red bar at the top, the first group of measurements. And on the lower one, there was a blink as well. So we remove those, and we get more accurate measurements. Uh, probably the people in the front can see that the standard deviations improved, and there were some small differences in the amount of the Ks. But the, the main thing here is to see that you can actually look at the measurements and tell if they were accurate. You can make sure they're good. If they're not good, you either repeat them and certainly delete all the ones. You want to make sure you have a total of at least three uh, of these that you can average at the end. This is another one here. This is a, a patient that looks like that's probably had a graft before, and we have an abnormal reading in number three, and that's where there was a blank. That's why there's no dots. So I'm going to show you these here. This is a, a post-PK patient, which we have a fair number of, and so you can go in and you can, the machine will automatically give you the triangles that it sees that are wrong, and you can go in and also look for the outliers. If one of the readings is way off for where the K is, where the axis is compared to the others, then you can get rid of it. And you can also look at this, and if they're all just, they don't make sense, well, then you, as I said before, you need to retreat the ocular surface. This is another post-PK patient where you can see uh, that we have some readings on the left side that are quite a bit divergent. Uh, as I mentioned, it'd be really nice if we had a mouse up here to, to do a pointer. I don't think this is a pointer. No, we don't have a pointer either. Uh, what it is, if you look at the purple line that outlines the limbus on the left side, you can see that it's offset a little bit. And uh, it's out over onto the sclera or the, the limbus a little bit more than it should. So what my technician did was they made the circle for the limbus smaller and they moved it a little bit over the center to the left and downward. And if you look at the two pictures, the upper one is before they repositioned it and then they repositioned it down below. And so with a lot of abnormal eyes that make the readings different, difficult, uh, this has been helpful for us to just make things for our calculations a little bit more accurate. Now I want to put this in perspective. We actually have the ability now to more accurately predict the vast majority of our IOLs preoperatively. And I think this has been very important in my particular case when I was a resident, we didn't even use IOLs. When I started practice, I remember a surgeon telling me that he only used 18 diopter lenses and that really worked for everybody. And then, of course, uh, around that time, if you just got a 2040 result, that was a great, great endpoint. But that's not the way it is now. Now we use multifocal extended depth of focus lenses. And these are great options for patients. 
but you need a very accurate post-operative refraction. You don't want your sphere or cylinder to be off more than half a diopter. Higher refractive errors lead to these lenses not working well, and they're much less forgiving than a monofocal lens. And just to put this in perspective a little bit more, this is a, a publication that just came out in December in JCRS. And this is looking at the refractive results of cataracts in Europe where they used the femtosecond laser. Now they divided up the groups according to what their preoperative vision was, but when it was all said and done, they had about a 71, 72% rate of eyes that had a refractive error of less than half a diopter half a diopter or less. And that's not really acceptable if you're going to do premium IOLs. You have to have better endpoints than that. And uh, these uh, surgeries were done up until 2015, so they didn't have some of the more advanced uh, calculating formulas at that point. But uh, we need to really get all this much more accurate. We need to use optical biometry and some of the new formulas. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Frank. Frank. And one thing I'd, I'd really like to emphasize that Frank pointed out is with, with the LensStar, you, you have access to every one of the measurements. So just having to accept what you're given on a printout really isn't acceptable. Um, with this, you can actually go in and, and drill down a little deeper and see exactly how each of the measurements was done, which ones you want to keep, which ones you should, ex should exclude. So it really takes the whole process of measurements up a notch. Next, we're going to hear from my friend Mike Snyder. And... Uh, Mike practices at the well-known Cincinnati uh, Eye Institute and has an academic appointment at the University of Cincinnati. He's published over 100 articles and book chapters, and Mike's main interest is cataract surgery and complex anterior segment reconstruction. I have a referral anterior segment practice, and when I not only don't know the question, I don't know the answer, I send the patients to Mike. He's also interested in the ergonomics of ophthalmology, and he's gonna speak to us today about integrating the LensStar into both the clinic and the operating room. Take it away, Mike. Warren, thanks very much. It's really a pleasure to be here with all of you today, and thank you for making the long trek down the hall. I know that we all got our steps in today on the way over here. Um, I do want to acknowledge that I do consult for Hogstrite. So I'm going to talk about different pearls, and we're going to break them up into different areas. Now, Frank just mentioned a number of the really good pearls within the testing zone, so I'm not going to spend a bunch of time with that. But in addition to what he has already mentioned, about being able to delete the data point. Unlike many other uh, machines, when the data is collected in many of the uh, other machines that we have out there, if you want to delete a data point, you have to delete all of the associated data points as well. So if there is a click that captured an axial length, a keratometry, a white to white, and all of the, and the lens thickness and such, if you want to delete one of those with some of the other machines, you have to delete all of the ones that were done with that same click, whereas with the LensStar, you can actually delete one at a time. If you've got a difficult patient, perhaps with nystagmus or unusual anatomy, and they're difficult to capture, that can be a real challenge. So one of the pearls for the testing zone is that all of the data is actually captured simultaneously with the same click of the button. And that's very important. We're going to get back to why that's important a little bit later. <clears throat> We always like to mention in the uh, testing zone, my team always asks the patient, have you removed your contact lenses prior to doing this study? Ask me why we ask that, right? Because uh, many years ago, about 10, 15 years ago, we actually had a patient who had the front of their contact lens measured and their refractive error was exactly the power of their contact lens. So there's just a little pearl that's not specific to the to lens star, but it's a really good thing to have in mind. We always have our uh, techs ask the patients, have you had refractive surgery? And sometimes we say refractive correction because sometimes people don't know that it was actually surgery or don't think so. There's a couple pearls now as we move to the exam lane. Frank mentioned how important the tear film is and I'm just gonna talk about a little bit of pragmatics about what I actually do personally in the exam room. I look at two pieces of data. I look at the placido ring first. And if the placido ring looks nice and even, and all of the Myers look beautiful, then I look at the computed topography component off the T-cone, which is uh, giving me the mathematical derivation of what those rings tell me. But I always look at the tear film first on the placido rings. 
For example, in this patient, there's, there's not really great placido rings, and so looking at the mathematical derivation, it really isn't so important. This is a terraform patient, and uh, as Frank mentioned, we just need to make sure that we uh, maximize their tear film uh, first and then deal with the other issues later. Then in this patient, I look at the right-hand side, I see that the Myers look really good, and I see that there has some astigmatism, but the astigmatism is fairly regular. So I'm looking at what is the regularity of the astigmatism once I've recognized a good tear film. Here's another patient, higher amount of astigmatism, uh, with a high degree of regularity. Now I know you guys are going to look at that one little spot in the infrotemporal area and you say, oh, well, there's a little tiny spot there. Th that one really is not particularly relevant and as we look at the mathematical derivation, that single data point gets expunged. Then we look at this and we say, well, that is not quite normal. I'm sure all of you look at this and you say, there's some irregularity there. This is a hyperopic ablation that was off-center and uh, an oh, unusually oblate uh, cornea, excuse me, prolate cornea. And so we expect that we might have issues. And if this patient didn't have refractive surgery, we ask them which one they actually had because they did. And then we've got one that looks like this. And we say, boy, the Myers look pretty good in most areas. There's a really high amount of astigmatism. So is there anything else we need to think about? Well, there is a regularity. We recognize that. The most irregular component is up there. And as it turns out, this could be mapped out fingerprint dystrophy. So we look at that and correlate our exam to it. Or it could be trauma related. It turns out it was trauma related in this instance. So then when we look a little bit further into the uh, hard data from the sheet that comes out, and this is all things that I'm doing in the exam room with the patient in front of me, I like to look first at the axial length. Is this a normal axial length? Is it an extra long eye? Is it a short eye? Is it an average eye? This one turns out to be an average eye. That's all good. Is there any difference between the two eyes? Is this an anisometropic patient? And is that important for us to know? Is it amblyopic, perhaps? If it's an anisometropic hyperope, we've got to think about that, right? This is all information I look at before my exam. What else do we think about in the examining room? Well, how about the corneal thickness? Actually, the Landstar is capturing your corneal thickness, so please use that data. This patient's corneas are slightly thickened. And so if you have a patient who's got thicker corneas than average, you might not be measuring their IOP properly. And so it's important to think about that. Are we overestimating or underestimating their IOP? When we look at the optic nerve, should we be more or less suspicious than we otherwise would be? It's all information that we have at our fingertips with the Landstar. And then I look at the anterior chamber aqueous depth. And in fact, my team members look at that before they dilate the patients as well, just so that we don't inadvertently dilate somebody who has a uh, shallower or uh, smaller anterior chamber, because we, we really hate to uh, induce anterior uh, chamber issues with closure. So our techs are, are looking at this all the time, so do I. Well, how about the difference between the depth between the two eyes? Is there a loose lens, perhaps, that we didn't recognize as one anterior chamber deeper than the other in an otherwise uh, same length eye? And when we interpret the uh, Barrett toric calculator's magnitude, there's a couple little tips that I want to pass along to you, and uh, they're very useful for me. First, I like to look at this part. Now, that is actually the predicted amount that a given implant lens with toricity will correct. In this instance, it's saying that a one and a half diopters of toricity will co correct roughly a diopter of astigmatism. But also look at the area down here. That's what the computer is telling you will be left over afterwards. So in the right eye of this particular patient, we've got a roughly 1.4 diopters of astigmatism of which 1.0 would be corrected and 0.3 would be left over, slightly less in the left eye. Now, this becomes important because we need to look at the axis of those two measures. Here you can tell that the axis of the steep astigmatism is the same as the axis of what's left over. Now here's where we need to think about it in detail. When we look at this in detail, not all eyes are the same. So we see on the right eye, the axis of astigmatism is the same as what's left over. In the other eye, you see that it's flipped, although be it not by a lot. That's important to know because you may not want to flip the axis and sometimes those magnitudes can be a little bit higher. There's a couple other things I want to call your attention to and these are from mistakes that I have made. Yes, indeed. So if we look at this, this is what I like to call be wearing of the teens and the centurions, okay? So look at this, we've got an axis of 100 degrees and there's a little bit left over at 10 degrees. 110 look pretty similar. That's a flip, right? So that's, there's 100 degrees and a 10 degrees, that's a 90 degree flip. 
And though there's not a much, much left over, you could see how, especially with the degree marker, you might inadvertently write down 10 instead of 100 or 100 instead of 10. Do not be confused. Always be alert to look at the steep axis that's in the center. Ask me how I know. Also beware of the teens, uh, because all of the teens are also going to look similar. 1, 6 with a degree mark looks a lot like 1, 0, 6. Don't confuse those. When we pick the power, there's a lot of really important things to discuss. However, I think I'm going to leave that to Dr. Sandoval and to Dr. Hill to discuss, and I'm going to skip right over that part. And now we're going to talk about lens star pearls in the operating room. Yes, the operating room, you say? Indeed, the operating room. Why would we need the lens star in the operating room? I wonder, okay? Well, remember that astigmatism we were talking about before? Well, when we get to the toric axis, we need to identify that toric axis. And yes, indeed, there are still people, lots of people in the world who are still using the purple magic marker to identify the axis. And this just doesn't look that perfect to me. And so, well, there's other people who have come up with solutions, but you know, using the purple magic marker, it's not that sophisticated and it doesn't work that well. And sometimes I'm betting that it can bite you in the pajamas. So I would recommend against that. There's much better techniques and the Lens Star is a better technique. Now for years, about 10 years ago, I started looking at uh, uh, landmarks on the cornea and landmarks on the uh, uh, vessels that are perforating. I drew little pictures on my plan and that worked okay. And uh, then Bob Osher created a system where we're actually able to pick those out with photography with the uh, um, Osher toric alignment system that uh, Hogstreit supported. And that was back in, I think it was 2009. So we're almost 10 years out from that. But there's a couple important things we need to think about. It's defying gravity. These two topographies are the same eye. Patient was tilting their head slightly to the right in one and tilting their head slightly to the left in the other. So what we really want to know is not what the astigmatism is relative to gravity. We need to know what the astigmatism is and what the landmarks are relative to when the keratometry was performed. Remember we talked about simultaneity before? Again, bubble marker works great, but you know, it's not relative to where it was measured. It was measured relative to gravity, right? So the simultaneity of the image and keratometry capture are super important. Remember when I talked about that one click where LensStar captures everything at the same time? Well, part of what it's capturing is an image of the anterior segment. And so when that keratometry is captured, the image of the anterior segment is captured at the same time. I don't care whether the patient had their head on their ear, as long as the keratometry in the picture are captured at the same moment. Then when I use my reference marks, I know I'm gonna be getting it right. And this information can now be transferred ergonomically directly to the operating room. This is my operating room, and you see the beautiful Hogstrite microscope there, which has the uh, platform on it that I can run the LensStar software directly on that platform and get a great view where I can just glance up at that screen and have the beautiful picture that I can uh, align my toric alignment with, right? So that's great. Now, some of you may not be as uh, lucky as I to have the wonderful Hogstripe microscope available. Uh, Hog has actually made the platform available so that the LensStar software can be run on Citrix. And this image is actually showing the LensStar software run on Citrix, showing up on an iPad on a flexible device, which I can glance up at, even with a uh, different kind of microscope and OR system. And when we look at how that is, you can see on the, uh, just to the uh, left of the base of the scope, there's just an articulating arm ho holding up that iPad and I can put it wherever I want to look at it very ergonomically. Now ergonomics are important and I want to make a, a note of that. Notice that we've also, uh, Hogs has designed this ergonomic chair that supports the low back. Incidence of back disease among ophthalmologists is about 55% diagnosed. So better seating is really important. And also uh, I think that we need to make sure for better foot pedal position. So LensStar has your patients covered and Hogstrite's got your back. So just to, for quick conclusions, I'd like to say that the LensStar is easy to incorporate into the workflow and into the clinic. There's lots of wonderful pearls for us to enjoy. The LensStar improves the biometry. It improves our accuracy with our outcomes, allows better execution in the operating room, and improves the patient's outcomes. And the LensStar helps us really from check-in all the way through post-op. And it makes the workflow easier. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Uh, next, we're going to hear from uh, Adi Abulafia. Um, Dr. Abulafia is here for, for, with us today from Israel. 
He completed his anterior segment fellowship under Graham Barrett in Western Australia and has served as the director of the IOL Calculation and Biometry Unit of the Intel Medical Center in Tel Aviv. And he's presently the director of the cataract services at the Sher Zedek Medical Center in Jerusalem. Dr. Abulafi has been the author of, a, of four uh, Journal of Cataract Refractive Surgery editorials, numerous publications, and is really best known for his work in astigmatism analysis and the toric intraocular lens. He's also a member of the ASCRS IOL uh, Power Calculation Subcommittee, and he's going to speak to us today about posterior corneal astigmatism and the Abulafia Koch Hill RBF Artificial Intelligence Toric Calculator. Thank you, Adi. <laughs> Thank you so much, Warren. Um, so uh, you are going to hear from uh, Warren and Helga all about the Hill RBF calculator and about its wonderful accuracy. But uh, one has to remember that many of our cataract patients will suffer from corneal astigmatism as well, which should ideally be treated with toric RLs at a time at cataract surgery. And uh, so what is more obvious than to have a Hill RBF toric calculator? Um, well, toric calculators are considered to be uh, the, the, um, um, the choice for these patients. However, uh, result, the results following their implantations can be sometimes unpredictable, since corneal astigmatism measurements, the methods of calculation, surgically induced astigmatism, and torqueal misalignments are all factors that might contribute to unexpected residual astigmatism. And today I want to focus about uh, the methods of calculation. So it's been six years now since Dal Koch had reminded us the role of the posterior cornea in torqueal calculations and that standard keratometry and topography machines tend to yield inaccurate results in assessing the net corneal astigmatic power. What they do, they measure the anterior cornea uh, and they uh, extrapolate the posterior cornea by using a fixed ratio which is not correct. So uh, Dr. Cope and his group evaluated the posterior cornea in a large group of patients using a dowel Schanflug device, and what they found out was that most of the posterior corneas were steep along the vertical meridian. Now, since the posterior cornea acts like a negative lens, it will actually create a net plus power along the horizontal meridian, inducing against the rule astigmatism. Another finding in the study was that in with the rule eyes, the more curvature in the front was correlated to more curvature in the back, whereas for against the rule eyes, uh, the magnitude, uh, there was no correlation between the magnitude of the front and the magnitude of the back surfaces of the cornea. He also found that there was much individual variability exceeding at extremes over 0.5 diopters. So based on their findings, they developed the Baylor nomogram in order to address the posterior corneal astigmatism effect and since then, a great deal of work has been done in order to refine our understanding of the posterior cornea and to find more accurate measurements in how to uh, do our toric calculation in our daily practice. So basically, two approaches have been taken. The first is the use of mathematical models, which actually takes uh, anterior corneal-based measurements and calculate a new estimated net corneal astigmatism, and the ultimate goal, direct measurements of the posterior cornea. And today I would like to focus on the abulafia koch formula. Uh, and this formula is based on a regression model, and it was developed in order to compensate for the posterior corneal astigmatism effect. So what it does, it takes anterior uh, curvature-based corneal measurements and calculates a new total corneal astigmatism with a new magnitude and a new meridian. So let's see one example. If we take 1.5 at 100 degrees, it will transfer that into 0.92 at 105 degrees. So well, we published a paper about this formula like two years ago, and the purpose of it was uh, to compare the accuracy of two models of torical calculators with or without the adjustments of the abulafia koch formula, and to compare those results to the baritory calculator. So for developing uh, the formula, we used um, lens star measurements from the Eintal Eye Center from Tel Aviv, Israel, and for validating it, we used the OWL Master 500 measurements from the Lion Eye Institute in WA, Australia. And for the method of calculation, we compared the Alcon model, which, used, uh, which is the previous Alcon model, which used a fixed ratio in order to calculate the estimated uh, tericity 
uh, at the corneal plane, uh, and the holiday and the laboratory calculator, which used the effective lens position for the same purpose. Now, both the Alcon and the holiday models were uh, um, evaluated with or without the adjustments of the Abu Lafia Coke formula. Uh, in order to exclude the influence of the SIA and torcal misalignment, we used post-operative corneal measurements and the actual post-operative torcal axis alignment. And bearing in mind that astigmatism is a vector, uh, the main idea was to try to figure out uh, the nature of the correlation between the X and Y components of the anterior curvature-based corneal measurements and the estimated net corneal astigmatism. And we, we did find a high correlation between the measurement corneal astigmatism by the lens star and the estimated corneal astigmatism, uh, total corneal astigmatism. And although we tried many sophisticated uh, ways to uh, improve it, it seems like a simple linear regression did the best uh, for our data set. So then we needed to validate uh, the formula and we, in order to calculate the errors in the predicted refractive astigmatism, um, we did uh, a vector analysis and uh, the results are, uh, you can see it just here, the error in predicted residual astigmatism for both the calculators without any adjustments. Both of them had against the real prediction errors with a center rate of more than 0.5 diopters. However, applying the regression formula shifted all these errors back to the center uh, with the center rate prediction errors which were close to zero. Now these results were uh, very similar to those of uh, the Barrett Tory calculator. Um, doesn't seem to move anymore. Can somebody help me with the slides? Maybe the battery is off. Yeah, now it's shifted along. Can you take it back, please? Way back, so, sorry for that. Oh. Uh, well, you saw everything now. I don't need to talk. <laughs> okay, so now we're all right. Okay, so uh, the results were similar to those of the Barrett uh, Torrey calculator. So the conclusion of our study was that the prediction of the post operative astigmatic outcomes can be optimized by adjusting standard Torrey Carroll calculators with the new formula. Now, just remember when using mathematical models, never use them together with total corneal astigmatism measurements because then you'll be correcting the same problem twice and you will get it wrong. Also, it is important to take care not to use the mathematical models with unusual corneas like keratoconus or post-refractive corneas because they were not designed to do so. Uh, so how does the new Hill rbf Tory calculator works? So for the spherical equivalent prediction, it uses the Hill rbf calculator. And for the torical cylinder power, the corneal plane, it's using the effective lens position. And for the total corneal astigmatism, it uses the Abu Lafia coke formula. And I'm very happy that Hagstreit and Dr. Hill uh, chosen our formula for, uh, to be in the lens, on the star because this is one of my favorite devices to measure corneal astigmatism. And here I'm going to echo uh, uh, the two previous talks because this, uh, the lens star is not just like a black box where you push buttons and get numbers. Uh, you can actually see the, the measurements and you can go quickly through the measurements and then you can uh, delete the ones that you don't like and you get a new uh, K, sets of Ks with standard deviation both for the flat K and the steep K and also for the steep meridian which is very reassuring. So let's go uh, quickly through uh, one calculations uh, together. So this is a 59 year old female. She has cataract and with rule astigmatism. So the first thing I do, as you might, I'm looking at the mirror and I see that they are okay, then I'm making sure that we are dealing with a pretty regular and symmetrical astigmatism, and then it's advisable to follow Warren Hill's methodology and to use primary and secondary supporting instruments in order to determine the steep meridian, and then you can do the same for the power difference between the meridians. And let's look at the different calculators here. So uh, if you look at the holiday calculator, you will probably pick a T5 or T6 for this patient. The Olson with the standard calculator T5, 
the Hill RBF, you would probably pick a T4 and also uh, for the Barrett. And for the spherical equivalent, all of them agree that it should be 22.5. So this lady had uh, an eventful cataract extraction with a T4 lens implantation. And um, the final axis, 93, just one degree off, depending on which calculator do you look at. Uh, Post-op refraction, plano, minus 0.25 at 5, so slightly um, with the rule, uh, residual astigmatism. And if you look at the error in the predicted refractive astigmatism, both the Holiday and the Olson calculators yielded uh, significant against the rule prediction errors, whereas using the Barrett and the Hill RBF toy calculator yielded prediction errors which were close to zero. Thank you. Thank you, Ari. Well, quick show of hands. How many here have used the Hill RBF formula? I hope every hand goes up, yeah. Before we get started, just a couple of interesting little things. We, you know, we as, we as surgeons are maybe not superstitious, but we certainly um, like to do the same thing over and over again because it's a happy comfort zone for us. We thought when we first introduced this that it would probably take four or five years for it to catch on. In the first year, we had 180,000 calculations for the online calculator alone, and more than that on the LensStar. So it's really been uh, quite remarkable, the acceptance of this uh, seemingly from out of the blue technology. May I have my slides up, please? There we go. Okay, so um, what you've been using up to now was version one. It was based on about 3,400 cases, and these were all very, very meticulously validated cases by a number of uh, beta test sites around the world. We're now up to um, a great number of beta testers in 19 countries, and we've expanded the boundary model for this. And version two of this will be available, be released by Hogstrite probably in about two weeks. So we'll be seeing that coming onto our machines. And then, so first and foremost, a, a project like this is never the work of one person. This is the work of 39 investigators in um, 17 countries. And if you, if you look at who some of the people are, I know the text here is kind of small. Many of these, the people who are investigators are some of the most well-known names in ophthalmology. And we've all really put our hearts into this. So this is a, a collaborative effort. It's a worldwide collaborative effort. And it's the work and really love of a lot of our fellow ophthalmologists from around the world. Now, why use artificial intelligence instead of Gaussian optics in a virgins formula? Well, we have adaptive learning, which means we have ability to optimize outcomes based solely on data. And uh, current methods limit possibilities to things that are already known. And manual methods of doing things um, really limit the number of options. And I'm going to show you some of the ways in which we've jumped over this and have taken things to the next level. It's also self-organizing, which means it has the ability to create a representation of the data independent of, of everything else. And it has an enhanced sensitivity to uncover relationships that were previously unknown. And we're beginning a project right now in Asia that may have some stunning implications for ophthalmology for that part of the world. And it's generally free of calculation bias. Every single person in this room has their favorite formula for short eyes, long eyes, steep Ks, flat Ks, this doesn't matter. This is all just pattern recognition. So let's do a little exercise in pattern recognition. Look at how little information you have for each one of these images, just a black line against a white background, but yet we really have no trouble figuring out who all these people are. I had trouble with Barbie because I didn't play with dolls when I was young. Okay, so our brains are set up for pattern recognition. That's a major part of what we do as human beings. Well, we can look at um, axial length, central corneal power, anterior chamber depth, a given spherical equivalent for an eye well implanted, also as a pattern. And with some of the scary fast computers we have and also sophisticated software, we can turn this into a calculation method. <clears throat> so let me share with you how this works, and it will become obvious to you in a heartbeat why this is so powerful. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a thousand random points into a little box. But these aren't random points, these are points that were selected using something called a Manhattan distance generator. And the Manhattan distance would be how you would walk from here 
to there across town through a number of city blocks. So this would be the Manhattan distance from here to there across Washington, D.C., as opposed to the Euclidean distance, which is how the crow flies. We're going to tell the, the um, artificial intelligence algorithm to figure out the internal organization of this seemingly chaotic collection of random dots. And we're going to give it 500 cycles, which with some of the computers we use is less than two seconds. So this is 40 cycles, 120 cycles, 500 cycles. And by the time we get to 5,000 cycles, we've actually figured out the internal organization of something that seems unknowable. If you stop for a minute to contemplate the power of something like this and think about how we can use this with lens calculations, really sky's the limit as far as accuracy. <coughs> so here's an example of how, how we can go about this. NASA, for the ST-5 uh, spacecraft, needed an antenna that had its certain characteristics. But there's space limitations and weight limitations and they, the only way they could come up with something is to use a process of iteration exactly the same as what we did for this. So this complicated kind of crazy shape fulfilled all the requirements of NASA and it was discovered using a computer algorithm that works by Darwinian evolution. So what they do is they, they pick a, a model, they do iterative changes, they find the best candidate models, and they do additional changes and additional changes, and what they come up with is something that fulfills the criteria. The key point is there, here is that they're uncovering relationships and patterns that we could never do on our own because, again, they're using scary fast computers. So this Darwinian process of iteration can also be used for lens power calculations. And I'll just share with you how we started out. We started out with, with 13 different um, parameters, including six millimeter spherical aberration, pupil size, age, gender, zodiac sign, mother's maiden name, favorite dessert, you know, and shoe size, and came up with these four. And this is basically how the iterative process works. We look at everything, we create a model, we create more models, we pick the best candidate model, and we just keep going through the process over and over again until we find out what works. And we thought that maybe 10 or 12 variables would give us better information. It turned out that four gave us the, the best. So we ended up with these four, axial length, central corner power, enter chamber depth, and spherical equivalent for an eye well that was implanted. We had a number of criteria that our team and the engineers at MathWorks used, and we, we found that this actually worked better than having more data. And then we uncovered some other things which I'm gonna share with you as well. So, um, and then once, once we picked what it was we wanted, how do you actually make a calculator? So first we, we pick our factors, then we organize the data, and then we run these through an artificial intelligence uh, method called a radial basis function. We calculate the difference between what it first tells us and what we see. We make some adjustments to some, some things called mathematical weights, and then we do it over and over and over again using a 500 core computer. And we just keep going and going and going till we can't get any better. And what comes out is a calculator and also something called a boundary model. And those of you who've used the RBF method know that you get inbounds and out-of-bounds calculations, and I'll share with you what that means. And then from that, we have software that we put in the LensStar iSuite software, and then also on the internet. So this is what it means when you have an inbounds or out-of-bounds calculation. This is the relationship between central corneal power and axial length, a very familiar graph for those of you who do this. And we can mathematically draw boundaries outside of which we can't support the calculation at a 90% level. Inside the boundary model, I can tell you with 90% certainty that you're going to be within a half diopter. So the red dots are those cases where we can't do that. So here's an example. When we have four factors, we have six pairwise boundary models. And let's take an example. We'll call, um, we'll have an axial length of 26 millimeters, Ks of 44, anterior chamber depth 3.25, totally normal eye. You can see all the green dots are within the boundary model. For this, you get an inbounds calculation. Let's take something that's a little bit um, less um, uh, normal, and we'll have a, a long eye, we'll have steep Ks, and we'll have a scary shallow anterior chamber. And suddenly, you know, our, our, our data points are outside the boundary model, so you get an out-of-bounds calculation. <coughs> now watch what happens when we increase the amount of data. So we're gonna take that 
that artificial intelligence model. We're going to take it from uh, more than 3,000 cases to 12,400 cases. We're going to have the exact same set of parameters. And what started out as an out-of-bounds calculation is now an in-bounds calculation. Again, I now have the data to support a calculation at a 90% level. And here's the ACD. The more data we have, the greater the breadth and depth of the calculation process. Now, Mike, Mike Snyder was part of a prospective study that we did back in 2016, 459 cases, broad range of axial length, central corneal power, um, the IOL power Ks. And we started to see something that really made us feel good about this. If you look at the outcomes, remember inbounds calculations mean we can predict the accuracy, half to half accuracy for 90%. For all eyes, we were at what? 91%. So this validated uh, what the mathematicians told us. Axiomyopia, 98%. I'd never seen numbers like this. And one thing that was really interesting, and some work now has started to prove this, is for the axial high probe, this is turning out to be one of the very best methods. Even when we get an out-of-bounds calculation, it turns out the numbers are very good. This was presented at ASCRS last year um, by Roman and his group. And 92%. So basically, we're starting to see that come up over and over and over again. Uh, Steve, this is the, the new method, which is uh, 12,400 cases. We now go down to minus five diers, diopters, up to 30, wide range of uh, central corneal power axial lengths, K, I mean, anterior chamber depth down to 1.24 uh, millimeters. And, uh, and we also now allow you to pick the spherical equivalent because we have enough data for that. So if you look at the top little red box, you can see that we're, we're changing so that you can put in minus 2.4 if you want. So we added 7,000 additional normal cases and a lot of really unusual Ks and anterior chamber depths. And uh, for the high axial myope, we're down to minus five. This is probably the largest minus power lens database in the world. And um, we have an expanded accuracy range for the very short eye. This is a um, study from uh, 2017. I think this was done by St Steve Scoper. And this is version two. And what we're starting to see is we're actually getting a little bit better. I think we're at 92% before, well, 94. For normal eyes, we went up to 97. And this, this I almost didn't believe. Helga Sandoval is going to share some data with you in just a minute from the practice that she works in with Carrie Solomon. And we're starting to see numbers that really have completely blown us away. Axial myopia, still 98%. Axial hyperopia, a little bit better. And as we all know, these are the hardest eyes to get good accuracy for. So this is incredibly encouraging. And again, we're still in the, be the beginning of this. This is an ongoing process. Now, here's where things really start to get interesting. Um, the Chinese have been telling us for a long time they don't like our formulas. Because why? They were optimized against eyes of European ancestry. And my family's from Scandinavia. And uh, our, the, my ethnicity is such that I have a large anterior segment and a small vitreous cavity. Most of my relatives are hyperopes. I'm an axial hyperope as well. The Chinese have relatively small anterior segments and larger vitreous cavities and a propensity towards myopia. And our formulas don't work as well for the Chinese as they do for Europeans. So what we're starting to find is that we now have the mathematical tools to begin to tell differences. And the first group we're going to look at is the Chinese eyes and um, trying to see if we can do a better job than the outcomes that are typical for Chinese ophthalmologists. These are some of the people who are participating at the AIR Hospital Group, one of the largest hospital groups in the world. Very well-known ophthalmologists in Singapore and uh, Johnny Chang in, in Hong Kong, very well-known ophthalmologists there. So our next big project is going to be to take on the Chinese eye and see if we can create an artificial intelligence model that has the sensitivity to actually make a difference for a different ethnic group. So right now, ophthalmology is really at the convergence of technologies for eye well power calculation, ray tracing, virgins formulas, artificial intelligence, interoperative aperometry. But artificial intelligence has the enhanced sensitivity um, and flexibility to over traditional methods to actually take us to the next level, especially if our calculation methods are better. And I think the future of lens power calculations is very bright, and this might be a large contributor to that. Thank you.
Oh, okay. So next is, uh, <laughs> sorry, next is Helga Sandoval, a dear friend. Helga works with uh, Carrie Solomon. She's the director of research at the Carolina Eye Care Physicians and is an adjunct professor of ophthalmology at the Storm Eye Institute um, at Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. She's worked with Carrie Solomon for the last 17 years. And for many years, uh, Dr. Solomon and uh, Dr. Sandoval's practice has probably had some of the best refractive outcomes in the world. For the last 15 years, I've been looking at physician databases. We're up to 280,000 implantations. And this practice is one of the top five practices uh, in the world for outcomes. Dr. Sandoval has over 45 peer-reviewed publications and has given more than 150 presentations. And what she's going to share with us is some of her initial data with version two of the RBF calculation method. Dr. Sandoval. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hill. Thank you um, to everybody for being here uh, this time. And yes, I'm going to show you uh, the process that we uh, currently have uh, using the RBL, RB, the Hill RBF formula to see where, how you can get to where we are. This is my financial disclosure, nothing relevant to this uh, presentation. So here is what we have. We currently have the Lenstar, and uh, we have version one of the formula. And we have uh, aligned the lenses that we currently use uh, for the uh, SN60 WF. We have um, the Hegis, the Barrett, as well as the Olsen and the Hill RBF. And we compare, um, you know, we make sure, as Dr. Snyder, uh, Snyder nicely showed, that all the measurements are consistently, and if we see a difference, we confirm that that difference indeed is there. And we compare the powers. You can see a difference maybe of a half diopter between the different formulas, but if you see something more than that, something is going on in there. Uh, but now, uh, version one doesn't have the uh, capability of doing monovision or any uh, other target than plano. So in that case, uh, when we have these patients, we go to the online calculator, and we just enter the information as it is required. And then we can have here uh, our measurement for a monovision patient. And here we can see the printout uh, from the online calculator, very similar to the printout that you obtained from the Lenstar, but now we have um, our patient's calculation. Uh, one thing that we uh, love about the formula is if there is a measurement that it doesn't make any sense at all, it warns us that, you know, the measurement is out of bounds, that we should be careful or not to use that uh, power based on the formula. Now here are the outcomes. So here we start working with Dr. Hill back in 2014, 2015. Um, this is the results of the retrospective uh, study that he did. And at that time we were with a monofocal lens about 97.5 within half diopter of uh, the target refraction and 95% with the thotic lenses. Now here is what we are three years later. Uh, our outcome within half diopter is uh, 98% with both the um, monofocal lens as and the thotic EDOF lens that we are currently using. And our outcomes at within quarter of diopter are uh, steadily improving as well. Uh, our, all our patients are 100% within three quarters of diopter of the intended target. But how we get there, that is the question. So the first thing that I will recommend you is track your outcomes, but track the numbers. Don't think that, okay, my patients are happy, I'm doing good, that's good, no. Track your outcomes, know where you are, and define where do you want to go, where do you want to be. Now the other key as it has been uh, stressed during this presentation is the preoperative measurements. You need to have a very good biometer like the Lenstar. Uh, you need to make sure that the surface of your patient is healthy. If there is dryness, dry eyes, you have to make sure that you optimize that ocular surface before you actually do the measurements for the um, surgery. Use the validation criteria as Dr. Snyder uh, said. Make sure you train your text to do that properly. And repeat, 
If you are not happy with the measurements, repeat. I can tell you that I'm the tech least favorite person in the practice because I make them repeat the testing. Unfortunately, patients have to come back for that purpose, but um, it is their outcome at the end um, of the surgery. And then, of course, the IOL powered calculation formulas. Um, we have to have modern formulas to get to better outcomes and to provide what is best for our patients. Uh, but now, what is the next step? Can we improve our uh, goal to uh, quarter of diopter, increase that uh, percentage? Probably we could do with the modern technology, um, new lenses, new things coming up in the market. Uh, I think that can be done. One thing that I also wanted to say is there is a difference. We just finished a um, multi-centered study using a TODIC EDOF lens. Um, of course, it's a study. The protocol is the same. All practices have to follow the same um, criteria. We were expecting to see the outcomes of all the sites um, about the same within that half diopter. And we have one site that is at 78% while we got a 98%. So why is that difference? We are using the same formulas, we are using the same device, why we have 20% difference between uh, these outcomes. So again, preoperative measurements, validation criteria, and repeat as if you need. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Helga. <clears throat> In the, in the last few minutes, I'm going to just share with you some things that may be transformative in ophthalmology. What's happening is we've all seen the calculation methods getting better. Barrett was really transformative for us, and I think the RBF method may have something to add as well. But industry is also responding right now, and we're starting to see uh, rumblings of exact IOL powers by uh, hyper-accurate methods to within a thousandth of a diopter. This is off-the-shelf technology. And then the keratometry may be getting better and better and better with newer methodologies. And I think when these two things begin to happen, we'll see another incremental change. So again, this is an exciting time for ophthalmology. We now have calculation methods and, and measurement technology that's very, very good. And in my opinion, if your half diopter accuracy that you track is less than 90%, with the LENSTAR and the different measurement technologies or, and um, calculation technologies available to you, you're probably doing something wrong. So this is completely achievable right now with current technology. So I want to, want to thank all of, our, all of our speakers today and to all of you for taking time to be with us, and I hope you have a good meeting. Thank you. <laughs>